you missing that hour yet? I know I am. It's wonderful when we come to miss this hour. It seems that things don't always work out the way they do or are supposed to. Last week, those of you who were here may recall that my message time got off to a bit of an intermittent start uh, through the vicissitudes of uh, modern communication technology. Uh, so I thought, well, just in case we had a problem this week, I, I brought something along just to sort of back it up a bit. Okay? <laughs> So just in case you can't put it together over there, uh, this is what we're going to use, all right? Can you hear me back there? Too? Right. There's something to be said for the tried and true, and uh, actually it's kind of interesting. I have some old uh, film video. My dad, the late uh, Reverend George Lewis, had a congregational picnic many, many years ago in Toronto, and he was making the announcements out in the, in the picnic field with that very megaphone, so it's, uh, it's been part of my life for a long time. Well, I assume most of you have been continuing to read the book, the, uh, the story, You're going through it week by week, and uh, just to reiterate uh, briefly for those of you who haven't or have perhaps forgotten, there are a number of plot lines in it, but there are four main characters. There's the king of Persia, uh, who goes by two names, Ahasuerus, which is a kind of a uh, Hebrew name that uh, is given to him and is sometimes found in different places and different translations. And then there's his Persian name, which is Xerxes. I prefer that one. It's easier to say. There is Haman. Haman uh, was an Amalekite, and he had a continuing hatred for the Jews which goes back many, many years to the time that the Hebrews uh, crossed over into Jordan and were met by the Amalekites, and they had uh, all kinds of fights and everything else. And so there's been a, an abiding and continuing hatred of the Jews by the Amalekites. And he has engineered himself a, a leading place in, in uh, the kingdom of Persia, the right-hand man to the king. Mordecai. Mordecai is a Jew uh, living in exile there hadn't returned to, the, uh, to their homeland, uh, to the Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, for reasons unbeknown, certainly to me, and he's continuing there to live there. And he has taken under his protective care his first cousin, a young uh, woman named Esther. And Esther herself, uh, which is a Persian name, uh, or Hadassah, which is her Hebrew name, uh, is also living there, probably born there in exile because they've been there for about 60 years or more. And so she's still living there, but she's lost her parents. And so Mordecai, her cousin, has taken her and probably actually adopted her in the terms of the culture of that day. And as we know, Esther becomes queen, queen to the king. Now, the book itself was written by a Jew uh, of and it, of sort of uncertain date. We're not exactly sure when it was written. It could have been in the 300s, but it could have been as late as, as the 100s as well uh, before Christ, apparently to promote the institution and the, the um, practice of the Feast of Purim. Purim comes from the Hebrew word pur, which means lots, kind of casting lots, throwing the dice, so to speak, which is what um, Haman did when he was trying to decide when to kill all the Jews that were in exile. And so this became a great celebration and feast for them, for that was prevented, which is the purpose of the book. The story has uh, many plot lines to it, as you who have read it will know. Uh, as I read it, and again, and became uh, aware once more of all of the various plot lines in there, I couldn't help but think it was rather like an episode of Coronation Street. Um, only this one has an actual coronation in it. So that was kind of interesting, but it just seems to have so much uh, different things going on, which seem to be unrelated in many ways. The story is patriotic, but it's not religious. You may have noticed that in the book, there is no mention of God, there's no mention of prayer, there's no mention of worship, no mention of sacrifice, no mention of anything religious. The closest we get to it is when uh, they, uh, Mordecai himself puts on sackcloth and ashes and, and when she herself talks about fasting as she prepares to go before the king. Those are very religious activities. You do not find any reference to this book in the New Testament. Jesus never quoted from it. You're familiar with the Roman Catholic reformer Martin Luther, 
Martin Luther has written these words, I am so hostile to this book that I wish it did not exist, for it Judaizes too much and has too much heathen naughtiness. As I was doing some reading about this book in preparation for sharing with you today, I came across a reference to a survey that had been done in North America in, say, within the last few years, a survey of preachers and they found out that the vast majority of preachers have never preached from Esther. And I like to be in the majority, so I say to you today, I have never preached from Esther in 40 years of ministry. And I may have to atone for that at some point, but that's the truth. I probably wouldn't have preached from it either had it not been for your pastor, Joel Sherbino, and my good friend, needing a holiday, so he says, and taking off and leaving this Sunday vacant, which not only happens to be the Sunday that we're dealing with Esther, but also happens to be the Sunday we lose an hour of sleep. So <laughs> maybe this is the time I'm supposed to be here. But all of that being said, I have to remind you, nonetheless, that in 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse 16, 16 and 17, we read, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped with every good work. It's in Scripture. God has ordained it to be part of his Bible, and so we have to deal with it, and I have to deal with it, and I hope you can deal with it with me today as briefly as we can. I want to focus on the passage that was read for us today, and that, that dynamic uh, dialogue between Mordecai and Esther, who is now queen, and how she is being asked, urged by Mordecai to go before the king and to plead for the Jewish people who, within about seven months, are going to be totally annihilated there in that exile country that they're living. And she knows the rules of the, of the uh, court. She knows the, the royal protocol. And she knows that she, like anybody, even though she's queen, if she appears before the king without being summoned, she will be summarily and immediately executed. So you've got on the one hand her knowledge of everything about the court, and on the other hand Mordecai telling her, asking her, begging her to go and plead for the Jewish people of which she is uh, one, of the, one of the members of, of the Jewish people. And so this little dialogue thing uh, unfolds. And I want to focus on that, and in particular, I want to focus upon verse 14, where there are two things that Mordecai says to her. But before we get to that, I want to ask you to do one thing. I want you to have a question in your mind. I'm not asking you to answer it, but I'd like you to think about answering it somewhere in your mind at some point, maybe even if today, but uh, hopefully later on. And this is the question, how big is your God? How big is your God? Now, some of you, well, all of you, as I look around, except for some of the younger folk uh, that are I'm thankfully present here today, uh, can remember uh, when Sesame Street started way back in the early 70s. Uh, I watched it because I had little people that I watched it with. And there was one little jingly thing that, that went on in the early 70s. It was written by a man named Bud Lucky, and it was originally entitled Infinity. Uh, and it was subtitled, That's About the Size. And the imagery in the animation of that day, which seems a little rough compared, very rough compared to what we have these days, the imagery there sh shows what we're not even sure what it is when it starts off. And it turns out, as the camera backs away, seemingly, it turns out to be a little crumb. And then it backs away, and the crumb is picked up by an ant. And then the ant with the crumb in his mouth runs between the legs of a beetle. And the beetle, com the beetle excuse me, comes up against a snail. And each one of these things is bigger and bigger. And then the snail, the bird lands beside us, and on it goes. And so we're coming back and back and back and back. And we're finally out of the town and out of the country and then ultimately out of the, uh, the Earth's uh, environment. We see the Earth, and it goes back and back, and it goes back past the sun and so on. And it's absolutely phenomenal, and it's called infinity. And there's a jingle that goes with it. That's about the size where you put your eyes. That's about the size of it. And then there's verses that go, and it's uh, Bud Lucky sings it and does a much better job than I do. And, and so with all of that in mind, I'm asking you 
to reflect on how big is your God because we're going to lay this over the top of the Esther account. And so, what is the answer to that? Well, what do we know about God? Or more particularly, what has God revealed to us about himself? Well, we know right off the bat that God, through, we know through Genesis and we know through John chapter 1 that God is the creator of all things and he's sovereign over his creation. We know that for a fact. We know that the magnitude of God is impossible for our human minds to comprehend. Isaiah chapter 40, verses, verse 12 says, and this is, the poetry in this is beautiful, and I'm going to repeat the, the question uh, so that it, it has more impact. Isaiah says, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Who has marked off the heavens with a span? Who has measured the heavens with a span? Who has enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure? Who has weighed the mountains on scales? Who has weighed the hills in a balance? As he tries to grasp the magnitude of God. The, the Apostle Paul, quoting from that passage in Romans chapter 10, chapter 11 rather, he says, with great awe, Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways. We know that God created humankind in his image to be the objects of his love. We referred to that last week when we, we wrestled once again with the question, what is the chief end of man? In Genesis chapter 5 verse 2 we read, male and female he created them and he blessed them and he named them. He blessed them. He didn't just create them and, and walk away. He blessed them and he named them after he created them so that we could be in a relationship with God and to be a blessing to him as he is a blessing to us. We know that in Adam, our human self-centeredness, our human and the consequent disobedience that flows out of that caused our humanity to fall from grace. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, says Paul. We know that God, who is the Alpha and the Omega, as we read in the book of Revelation, we know that God sees the beginning, sorry, sees the end from before the beginning. I am the beginning and the end, he says. This same God, he's not going to allow his purpose plan, his purpose end for his creation to be frustrated by such little sinful people as you and me. In Isaiah 55, he says, and again, this is a beautiful expression of the magnitude of his word, <clears throat> verse 11, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and it shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. This is the magnitude of God's dynamic word. We know that God undertook a plan then of redemption and reconciliation. We know that that plan moved through Israel and culminated in the, the, the incarnation of his word in Jesus Christ, in his birth, in his life, in his ministry, his death, his resurrection, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. We know that God created a nation through Abraham in order that this nation could be the birthplace for his saving word in Jesus Christ. And we know that God can continue to be at work through all of his history, all of the history of his people, over and over. Read the Old Testament. As you read the Old Testament, what do you see? You see not just a history of a people, but a history of God. God working his plan of redemption through these chosen people, these people who, he, he didn't just choose them, he created them. He could have gone to any nation that was in the world at that time, the strong ones. He could have gone to Persia, he could have gone to Egypt, he could have gone to China. He could have picked any one of the existing powerful nations, but he created a nation out of nothing through Abraham. And through that nation, he has continued to work his saving word as he inexorably moves through our history to the point of our ultimate and complete and eternal reconciliation with God. And the biblical evidence reveals quite simply and categorically the great divide that when our humanity chooses to be with God, chooses God's way, there is blessing, there is union with God, and there is eternal life. And when our humanity chooses 
to go the way of man, to go the way of the world, then there is separation from God, there is sin, there is death, and there is destruction. It's as simple as that. Now back to the book of Esther. If indeed in your own minds you have taken your eyes away from the commonplace and the common round of our human lives, and you've allowed the Spirit to bring you back and get at least some sense of the awesomeness and the magnitude of God, now let's start coming back in again and see where that word now can be laid over the top of a book that doesn't even mention his name and doesn't give him honor and glory for being there. When you consider all of the plots, which we're not going to do today so you can breathe lightly, they all seem so individual, they all seem to be not really related. Haman and his uh, things that he wants to do. Vashti, his, uh, the king's first king, for whatever reason, she was disobedient and she got disposed of. And Haman's trying to get his place established in the kingdom. And, and Mordecai's over there in exile. And little Esther's over there in exile. And things are happening. And they don't really seem to be related. They're just things going on in their lives. But they culminate in this story with three things. They culminate with the crowning of this beautiful young um, Israelite woman. They come, and so she becomes queen. They culminate with the saving of all of the Jews from destruction. And it culminates with the destruction of those who chose to oppose God. Was this coincidence? Was the fact that all of these various plot lines came together into that, that crucible of, of Esther having to make that decision whether or not to go before the king and, and really risk being killed on the spot? Was this coincidence or what? Well, where are your eyes? Where are you putting them? Look at verse 14 of the passage that was shared with us this morning. You, you, you know the context. Esther is balking. And why shouldn't she? She's a, a, a little woman who has come from nothing, she's in exile, she owns nothing, she has nothing, she's basically in servitude to the, to the uh, Persian king, and she's scooped up in this net as he looks for a new bride, and she finds herself the king's queen. She can't possibly get any more powerful than that. She's got maids and servants and eunuchs and people all looking after her. She is just, life is great. I mean, this is the Persian equivalent of winning the lottery. She's got everything she needs. And Mordecai now is sticking it to her and saying, if you don't do this and run the risk of getting killed, then all of our people, including yourself, are going to die, ultimately. What a decision to have to make. So when we look at that first part, and I just briefly look at it, we look at that very first thing, because Mordecai says two things to her, and this is the first thing he says. For if you, Esther, and it's kind of neat, because they're not actually talking to each other. I don't know if you noticed that or not. They haven't met somewhere at Tim's to sort of work this out. Uh, they're, they, they're not meeting out in the courtyard, because, see, he's not supposed to have an audience with the queen. And so they're meeting through Hathak, who is one of the eunuchs. So this is kind of like H-mail that, that they're, wor they're working together. But... The dialogue is put together in such a way that we can readily understand it. He says, For if you keep silence at such a time as this, then relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter. But you and your father's family will perish. The decision is now hers. He is telling her, as a prophet of God, and this is where we lay God's word now over this, even though his, God's name isn't mentioned, he is in essence saying to her that God's word is not going to be frustrated by you and by the decisions that you make against his will. Because if you choose to keep silence and our people are threatened with annihilation, God will find another way around you. He will raise up somebody else. He will cause something else to happen that is going to stop this from happening. And you know what, Esther? You will lose because you have chosen your own way. 
And so you will be separated from God. You will fall into sin. You will ultimately die. God's will shall not be frustrated. The second thing he says to her, and this is where I think it just kind of comes right down to a real close focus. He says, Esther, who knows? This is this writer putting it this way. Who knows, perhaps you have come to this royal place, this royal dignity, this royal position for just such a time as this. Perhaps you have. If that was put in the context of God's prophecies through a prophet, categorically the wording would be something like this. I am convinced, as the Apostle Paul says, I am convinced, Esther, that you have come to this royal dignity, this royal place, to be the instrument of God at this time and at this place. You see, all the human plot lines have come together for her to be queen. Think about it. How did she get there? What are the chances, we might say, what are the chances of this little Hebrew girl born in exile? She had to be because they've been there over 60 years and she's just probably a teenager. This little Hebrew girl who has nothing but who has been gifted with an extraordinary beauty. What are the chances that she could rise to be the queen of that heathen land? Well, if you ask our world, our world might simply say, well, that's just good fortune. That's just good luck. That's just serendipity. That's just kismet. That's just coincidence. Well, I don't believe it is. And God's word tells us that it's not. And so what I'm asking you now is to continue to bring your eyes further down. We've, we've looked at how and I'm not going to bother with what happened. You know how it ended up. She did go and she did go before the king and she didn't get her head cut off and she did plead with the king and, king and it unfolded and the people were saved and Haman died and, and you know, everybody lived more or less happily ever after. But the point is that she did what she did with great risk to herself. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave that with you. But I want you to find, and this is, I'll bring it all down now and conclude with this. In your minds, in your spiritual minds, I want you to bring it down and think now, not just of Esther and what happened there, but to come down through the ages, closer and closer through the New Testament church, through the history of our church, through the history of our world, continue down to your birth into this world, to the events that have happened in your life, to the people that you've met, to the partner that you met and, and subsequently perhaps married, to the courses you've taken in university, to the people you met there, Bring it down and, and just start reflecting a little bit on all of the things, all of the plot lines in your life and think about how this has happened. Think about the pain. Uh, think about the things that may be happening right now, the decisions that you have to make, the, 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 the fears that you have in your life, the worries that you have. Think about what is happening and wonder, how did this all come about? And then hear God's word. To the prophet Jeremiah and through that prophet to you and to me today, God says at the beginning of that prophecy, verse 5, and listen to this, before I formed you in your mother's womb, before you were born, sorry, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. Have you stopped to think about that? as you allow your eyes to come down on your own life, after having gone and tried to embrace something of the cosmological immensity of God and his power and his will, and how he has come down and he's saying, before I formed you, you're not an accident of creation or of the laws of creation. I knew you, the Almighty says, before I formed you in your mother's womb. And in knowing you, I consecrated you to do my will and to be an instrument in the unfolding of my plan of salvation for all of humanity and for creation. And Jesus himself said, as he, in his earthly ministry, recorded for us by John in chapter 15, verse 16, Jesus said, and listen to this, 
You did not choose me, but I chose you. Isn't that interesting? So often we talk about if you made a decision for Jesus and you know, we get this feeling that somehow Jesus is like a bunch of those gods all sitting up on a, on a shelf somewhere and you kind of check them all out and you say, oh, I like that one with the beard there. I think I'm going to take him. He says nice stuff. And there's this sort of human self-centeredness that feels that somehow we have chosen Jesus. We've thought it all out and we've made this big decision and, and he is now my savior. I've chosen him. And Jesus comes back and says, that's not how it happened. I am the word of God and I was working in your life and I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb, before I formed you in your mother's womb. And now in your life, my word is working in you and I have chosen you and I have appointed you. Why? To some nice status in the royal courts of God? No, I've appointed you to bear fruit in my kingdom, fruit that will last forever. So consider your life, and last, right down, back down to the crumb and the ant, I ask you to consider us being here today. All the other possibilities that could and did and do exist in your life, nonetheless, you chose to be here today. You chose to be in this dynamic with these people, with me in your midst and sharing God's word, a dynamic, an experience that has never happened before and will never happen again. We are here today offering our praises and our prayers to God, receiving the ministry of his word in unique and never repeatable ways again. And that word of God is coming to us today from all of its immensity and is speaking to us and saying, I'm choosing you and I'm using you and I'm blessing you and I'm saving you and I'm appointing you to be an instrument in the unfolding of my plan for salvation, not just for you, but for all of creation. Wherever you may be right now, in your life, in your decisions, in your experiences, in your relationship with God, you and me, like Esther, are faced with yet another choice. Do we continue with Jesus Christ or do we go our own way? The Apostle Paul sums it all up for us, has read for us in our scripture, and I'll close with this. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 30. As you consider being here today under the ministry of God's word, which is inexorably working in you and through you, to be able to join and to say, in wondrous faith that in the face of everything in this life, in all that I don't understand, in all the risks that I have, in all the things that I've experienced, in all the paths that I, I have not yet trod, to be able to say together in faith, I know, we know, that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, those who have been called according to his purpose. And those who he predestined before you were born, he called. And those who he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Thanks be to God for his word working in us today, bringing you here to share in this time of worship and the ministry of his word proclaimed to you through this earthen vessel before you. The fact that you're here, coincidence, kismet, fortune, happenstance, or what? The word of God says none of those. For you are here because you were born 
for just such a time as this. Amen.